ages, the majority of houses were covered with some form of thatch. Reed and straw were the best materials, although the humbler dwellings of the peasant classes were more likely to be covered with flax, heather or turf. Despite its attractive appearance, thatch is not an ideal covering. Its life is usually little more than 40 years, it's an obvious fire hazard and it can harbour vermin. The risk of fire was the most significant factor in its demise, particularly in the growing towns of the 15th and 16th centuries. Until the Industrial Revolution, the use of slate was confined to those areas where it naturally occurred, Wales, Cornwall, the Lake District and Scotland. However, in the early 19th century, with improvements in transport, it became a very popular roof covering. It's virtually impermeable and highly resistant to chemical attack. In traditional construction, the slates were often laid in diminishing courses, with large slates at the eaves and progressively smaller slates towards the ridge. This, together with the use of random slate widths, gave the roofs an unmistakable character, which is rarely matched in modern slating. Slating is still common, particularly in conservation work. It's available in a range of sizes and thicknesses, but is rarely laid to diminishing courses because of the cost. It's a very durable material, and in many cases, the life of a slate roof is determined by the quality of the nails and battens rather than the slate itself. Slate is still quarried in North Wales, but nowadays much of it is imported. In the early part of the 20th century, synthetic slates were introduced to Britain. They were made from a mixture of asbestos and cement, although in recent years, the asbestos has been replaced by synthetic fibres. The slates are less durable than their natural counterparts, but are significantly cheaper and lighter. Because of their reduced weight, the tail, or bottom of the slate, is secured by small copper disc rivets to prevent lifting in high winds. In several parts of the country, the traditional roof covering is made from slabs of sandstone or limestone. These are often referred to as stone slates. Like natural slate, they were traditionally laid to diminishing courses. These Cotswold slates, quarried from a local limestone, are almost 150 years old. In traditional work, the stone slates were fixed with small wooden pegs. These are still found today, although the slates are more likely to be fixed with copper nails or brass screws. The roof structure has to be very strong to support this thick, heavy covering, and for economic reasons, it's rare to find natural stone slate in modern construction. The slates have to be quite thick because, unlike natural slate, they're not impermeable. To guarantee weather protection, the roof was usually laid to a steep pitch to shed water as quickly as possible. Plain clay tiles have been used in Britain since the Middle Ages, but their use declined when slating became cheaper in the 1800s. It was not until the end of the century that new industrial techniques produced cost-effective machine-made tiles. Plain tiles vary in colour from red to deep purple and are immediately recognisable due to their small size. 
The size has, in fact, remained fairly constant for centuries. Wooden shingles, like plain tiles, can be laid to vertical and sloping surfaces. Slightly larger in size, they were originally made from oak, although the early American settlers discovered western red cedar, a more durable and stable material. Their lifespan is about 50 years, half that of a plain tiled roof. Plain tiles have small projections called nibs, which hook over the tiling battens. The tile is not flat, but slightly cambered. This helps prevent capillary action occurring under the tiles once they're laid. Plain tiles and slates need to be laid in a special way if they're to provide an effective roof covering. The method shown here may seem correct, but it's wrong. If each tile laps the one immediately underneath, the rainwater can run off the top tiles and through the joints of the tiles below. Laid like this, the tiling is useless. To overcome this problem, the tiles are laid with a double lap. In other words, each tile laps two others below. Slates and plain tiles will only prevent rain penetration if laid this way. Water running off the top tile can still penetrate the joints of the tiles below, but another tile is below this, so the water runs safely off the roof. The distance by which a tile laps the next but one tile below is known as the head lap. The distance between the batten centres is referred to as the gauge. This is the same as the exposed face of the tile called the margin. On plain tile roofs, the head lap should be at least 65 millimetres. In areas with high winds and heavy rainfall, protection can be improved by either increasing the head lap or raising the pitch. Those parts of the country that had trading links with Holland sometimes have older roofs covered with pantiles. In the 1700s, production started in this country, but on a very limited scale. They have a distinctive shape which makes them easy to recognise. Pantiles overlap at the sides and don't therefore have to be laid with a double lap. In the late 1800s, other tiles based on a similar principle became popular. Clay Roman tiles, for example, are loosely based on tiles originating in southern Europe. By the 1900s, their cost advantages over slate and plain tiles led to their widespread use. There are a number of patterns. The simplest is probably the single Roman. The most popular is certainly the double Roman. They normally have two nibs at the top and may or may not have nail holes. The principle is quite simple. Because of the side lap, rainwater can't penetrate the side joints, so a double layer of tiling is not necessary. They have a number of advantages over the traditional double lap coverings. They're lighter, can be laid to shallower pitches, and because of the reduced labour required, they're generally cheaper. In the first half of the 20th century, they became very popular and hundreds of designs were produced in this country or imported from abroad. In the 1950s, developments in technology enabled the production of concrete tiles, which nowadays account for more than 80% of the market. The side joints interlock rather than overlap for added protection against rain penetration. Interlocking tiles are now available in a range of colours and shapes. They're easy to fix and can be laid to pitches as low as 15 degrees. Before examining a roof in detail, it's helpful to know the terminology. 
where a roof overhangs a gable end, a verge is formed. The guttering runs along the eaves. The top of the roof is known as the ridge. There are many other specialist terms to learn. are felted to prevent fine snow and rain being blown into the roof space. Before the 1930s, felting was rare and roofs were often given additional protection by torching. This was a mixture of mortar and hair troweled into the gaps between the tiles from inside the roof. Although fairly effective, it retained moisture, thus encouraging rot attack in the battens. It was also easily dislodged by movement of the roof timbers. On this roof, the slaters are using a reinforced bitumen felt underlay, comprising a fibre layer embedded in bitumen. Battens are usually treated against rot and insect attack. They're fixed with galvanised nails with end joints meeting over rafters. Their spacing and size depend on the nature of the covering. Some underlay materials are vapour permeable. They prevent water penetration but allow vapour to escape thus reducing the risk of condensation in the roof space. The underlay should sag slightly between the rafters so that any water can drain down the felt to the gutter. At the eaves, it's common practice to run the underlay into the gutter, but some underlays are not designed to be exposed to the elements and can be damaged by ultraviolet light or birds. It's better practice to use a strip of polythene DPC or a purpose-made filler at the eaves. Some fillers include a flexible comb to prevent birds and insects getting under the tiles. This roof is about to be covered with concrete single lap interlocking tiles, hence the wide gauge of the battens. A valley is formed where the two roof slopes meet. Valleys are normally formed in lead, zinc or by using special tiles. However, on this site, the designer has chosen modern glass fibre valley sections which are fixed in position after the felt has been laid. This is probably the cheapest and easiest method of forming a valley, but its life and maintenance costs are unknown. The bottom of the first course of tiles is supported by a fascia board. This board must be fixed at the correct position to ensure an even line of tiling. If it's fixed too low, there's a risk of wind-blown water penetrating the tiles. Raising the fascia board provides an even line of tiling, but creates other problems. Ponding can occur if any rainwater finds its way through the tiles. As water runs down the felt, it collects behind the fascia board. This can be prevented by a strip of timber known as a tilting fillet. It lifts the felt and helps water drain into the gutter. It's normal practice to fix all the perimeter tiles with non-ferrous nails or clips. The rest of the tiles aren't fixed in position and stay in place because of their weight and their interlock. However, in exposed situations, or on very steep roofs, it may be necessary to nail or clip every single tile. The lap will depend on the specific characteristics of the tile and its pitch, 
but in general, modern tiles will have a lap of about 75 millimetres. In exposed areas, this may need increasing. Concrete tiles were originally coloured with a granular face, but they soon faded. Nowadays, most are through coloured. The appearance of these tiles has been artificially aged to resemble traditional double Romans. At the ridge, the top course of tiling forms part of the roof perimeter and should therefore be nailed. On this roof, the ridge will eventually be protected by a semicircular tile bedded in mortar. The annex roof on the right is much steeper than the main roof and all the tiles need nailing to ensure they stay in position. When both slopes are complete, the tiles either side of the valley can be cut. The ends of the tiles are filled with mortar to provide a weatherproof finish. The verge, in other words where the roof overhangs a gable end, can be finished in a number of ways. The most common method is to bed the verge tiles in mortar. They may also need clipping to stop them lifting in high winds. The clips are fixed to the tiling battens. On this roof, there's a timber barge board attached to the roof structure. The barge board supports the undercloak. The undercloak, which is about 150 millimetres wide, is usually made from asbestos-free composition board. It projects about 50 millimetres from the wall. Tile manufacturers recommend various mixes for bedding mortars. A typical mix is three parts sand to one of cement. Additives can be provided to colour the mortar. Bedding, rather than pointing, provides the most durable finish. The ridge or hip tiles are also usually bedded in mortar. Ridges and hips are very vulnerable parts of the roof and often the first to suffer in high winds. A full bed helps ensure durability. The end ridge tiles, the most vulnerable, can also be wired to the roof structure. Special ridge tiles are sometimes used to terminate gas flues, soil vent pipes and extractor fans. Where the tiles have a fairly pronounced or bold roll, the mortar bedding for the ridge tiles will need to be quite thick. On these modern pan tiles, for example, there's a risk of the mortar sagging in the troughs of the tiles. This can be prevented by bedding small slips of tile, known as dentils, under the ridge. Although ridges and verges are usually bedded in mortar, there are modern alternatives. These special verge tiles avoid the need for bedding or pointing and don't require an undercloak. On this site, the verges are plastic. The individual units are nailed to the tiling battens. The appearance is similar to that of a traditionally bedded verge. Some ridges are dry fixed. They're strapped to a plastic channel which can also form part of the roof ventilation system. Roofs are insulated for environmental and financial reasons, but water vapour can pass through the insulation and condense on the cold underside of the roof. Eaves to eaves ventilation is the most common method of removing the moist air. As wind blows across the roof, changes in air pressure cause air to flow through the roof space. Eaves to ridge ventilation is more effective. This works irrespective of wind strength and direction due to natural convection currents within the roof space. At the eaves, the air can enter through a plastic ventilation strip fixed to the top of the fascia. Plastic trays help channel the air into the roof space. Ventilation strips can also form part of the soffit.
This refurbished office block is being covered with natural slate. Large blocks of slate are quarried by machine and then spit by hand to form individual slates of the correct thickness. They're available in a range of sizes and the edges are normally chamfered for reasons of appearance. The size of the slating battens depends on the spacing of the rafters. If battens are not wide enough, they're likely to split when the slates are fixed. If they're not thick enough, they're likely to spring as the slates are nailed in position. This prevents the nails being driven home properly. Like plain tiles, slates are laid with a double lap. However, because slates don't have nibs, every slate has to be secured. One approach is to head nail them. Head nailed slates may be susceptible to wind damage and they can lift, especially if laid to a shallow pitch. Center nailing avoids this problem. It's always used for artificial fibre cement slates, which are lighter and weaker than their natural counterparts. Even then, they're vulnerable, so the tail of the slate needs to be secured. Natural slates can be pre-holed at the quarry, but the traditional method is to hold them on site using a special hammer called a zax. Slate should be holed from the underside. The resultant spalling forms a countersink for the nail head. Aluminium, copper or silicon bronze nails should be used. The headlap depends on the size of the slates, the exposure and the roof pitch. Large slates, say 600 by 300 mil, can be laid to pitches as low as 20 degrees if the headlap is 130 millimetres. Large slates can be used on steep roofs, although their extra weight places additional strain on the nails. This particular roof is hipped and therefore the slates have to be cut on site. It's not quite as easy as it looks. The hip will eventually be protected with special hip tiles bedded in cement mortar. It could also be protected by lead. This old school is being recovered with plain tiles. Like slate, they're double lap, but because of their nibs, it's not necessary to nail every single tile. It's usually sufficient to nail every fifth course and the perimeter. On steep roofs, say over 60 degrees, the tiles are more vulnerable to wind damage and it's normal practice to nail every course. The battens need to be close together due to the double lap and the size of the tiles. This is one reason why plain tile roofs are so expensive. They're also quite heavy, about 40% heavier than interlocking concrete tiles. At the verge, plain tiles form an undercloak and lift the batten slightly to prevent water draining over the edge of the roof. Slate verges can be formed in a similar way. There are a number of special decorative tiles available. The club crested ridge tiles on this roof are combined with a fleur-de-lis gable finial to provide ornamental detailing.
Other decorative features include three courses of club tiles and bonnet tiles on the hips. Plain tiles can also be fixed on vertical surfaces with special angle tiles at corners. The junction between a wall and a roof must be sealed to prevent water penetration. Metal flashings, usually formed from lead, are the most common method. It's relatively cheap, easy to cut and dress, and very durable. Mortar flashings are sometimes found, but differential movement or settlement of the roof structure can cause cracking and damp penetration. On this roof, the joint between the wall and tiles is protected by bitumen roofing felt. This cannot be regarded as a long-term solution. Where the top of a roof abuts a wall, an apron flashing is used. The flashing is dressed over the tiles, runs up the wall and is turned into a bed joint. On cavity walls, a cavity tray should be positioned above the flashing to eject any water. Open perp joints allow the water to escape. This detail ensures that the room below stays dry. This side flashing is made from a single piece of lead, but bossing it into shape over the bold roll of the tiles causes thinning and increases the risk of tearing. A more effective flashing is formed by individual soakers covering each tile with a stepped cover flashing, fitted over the top and tucked into the brickwork joints. A tray should be located in the cavity just above the cover flashing. In some situations, a render, often supported by a stop bead, can take the place of the stepped cover flashing. This seems to be a cost-effective solution where roofs abut solid walls and where no cavity tray is necessary. Soakers also offer the best protection for plain tile and slate roofs. They're normally laid in between the double lap to prevent wind uplift. The cover flashing can be tucked under the copings or turned into mortar joints. Where the bed joints are widely spaced, a groove can be cut just above the soakers. The top of the cover flashing will be turned into this groove. On this roof, Lead has also been used for the gutters behind the parapets. This is quite complex work, but done well, it should easily last a hundred years. Chimney flashings are also quite complicated. The flashing normally comprises a back gutter, a side flashing, and a lower apron flashing. Some chimneys also include DPCs. The principles of roofing are simple. It's the details that are complex. In practice, most roofing defects aren't caused by material failure, but by poor workmanship or inappropriate design.